Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining the Ministry of Housing, Urban Renewal, Environment and Climate Change's webinar titled Ecosystem Restoration, the Jamaican Context. Our webinar today is part of the Ministry's celebration of National Environmental Awareness Week and the commemoration of World Environment Day, which is celebrated worldwide on June 5 of each year. This year's theme for World Environment Day is Ecosystem Restoration and 2021 marks the start of the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. I am Joni Jackson, Director of Natural Resources in the Ministry, and I will be your moderator today. Please stand for the National Anthem. The National Anthem represents the beauty, pride, strength, and resilience of Jamaica and our people. My name is Agent Sasko. Please stand as we honor Jamaica, our culture, and our history. This afternoon's webinar promises to be an interesting one, but before we get into the agenda proper, please note the following. All participants are asked to keep their microphones on mute unless they are speaking. Questions and comments will only be taken during the discussion segment. If there are questions or comments related to any audio, visual, or other technical issues related to the execution of the webinar, these should be placed in the chat. During the discussion segment, you may pose questions by either typing them in the chat or raising your hand. Once I have acknowledged you, you can unmute your microphones and speak. First on our agenda is the message from Honorable Colonel Charles Jr., Minister of Housing, Urban Renewal, Environment and Climate Change. Minister Charles. Thank you, Joni. Uh, let me, of course, um, join in welcoming everyone uh, to this webinar hosted by our ministry, the Ministry of Housing, Urban Renewal, Environment, and Climate Change in celebration of National Environmental Awareness Week um, and also World Environment Day on the very important theme, ecosystem restoration. Now, this is an important calendar event for us uh, because it gives us an opportunity to, to highlight uh, the critical role that our ecosystem plays to our lives and livelihoods. And of course, it heralds the beginning of the United Nations decade of ecosystem restoration. Uh, the uniqueness of our biodiversity and ecosystems in Jamaica cannot be overemphasized. Our biodiversity is rich and the island actually is ranked fifth among the islands of the world for endemic plants and several animal species, including amphibians, reptiles, and land birds. So Jamaica is important globally in this regard. We also have a very diverse range of ecosystems, including wetlands, mangrove forest, and inland forests, coral reefs, seagrass, beds, ponds, rivers, you name it, Jamaica has it. So biodiversity plays an important role in our socioeconomic development and it is also intrinsic um, to our cultural identity and heritage as a people. We are connected 
to our environment in Jamaica. We rely heavily um, for you know our life, our existence, um, and even more so um, as our fishermen and farmers for our livelihoods. So we know that it is critical in terms of agriculture, tourism, fishing sector, farming, etc. That means that the loss of biodiversity, which is attributed to a number of risks, including climate change, pollution, um, overexploitation, and the destruction of the habitats, is something which we have to pay attention to. Um, the ecosystem is critical. And so the theme itself for this week is something which really uh, we, we don't see as just a phraseology, but as something to put into action. And this morning, we had the opportunity with our colleagues from UAE and Nepal to go out onto the Palisades uh, coastline and to be planting some, some mangrove seedlings. So mangrove rehabilitation, tree planting, recycling, cleaning up our environment, all of these things are critical to our ecosystem <coughs> restoration. Uh, we're gonna hear more from the panel discussion, which will be focused on ecosystem within the Jamaican context. Uh, but I can tell you that for us, there's a lot that we're doing at the ministry uh, with acting CTD, Guthrie, Pierce, Hales, and the team focused on really advancing the kind of legislation and policies that will create what we define as an enabling framework for us to really advance the environmental agenda. Uh, and we know that it's also connected to climate action. So we are looking on a lot of issues so that we can address the landslides, which we have over time observed due to deforestation and also due to the inappropriate um, agricultural practices as well as high rainfall intensity. Uh, we're looking on issues relating to severe soil degradation due to fires, um, overuse of agrochemicals which pollute our groundwater and adversely affect downstream users and all of our marine resources. All of these are issues which you are going to hear about and which as a ministry we, we take seriously um, mm -hmm. and we examine these issues to make sure that the legislation, the policies, the regulations, the operation provide that framework for us to protect you, to protect Jamaica, um, and to, to protect our environment. As you said, uh, we want to also commend the partnerships that we have developed. Uh, the partnerships such as one strong partnership with the National Environment and Planning Agency, NEPA, And so through partnership, uh, we are all investing our time and our energy uh, to, to really focus on preserving Jamaica's ecosystems and to focus space on the conservation of our natural resources. Um, I want to note also the work being done on mangrove restoration, which is important for sustainability of our fishing stock um, and the establishment of fish nurseries, as well as reforestation and our and afforestation. Indeed, uh, the, na the National Tree Planting Initiative, our three million trees in three years, which is being pursued by the Forestry Department in collaboration with several, I mean, I think we have more than 100 now, public and private sector stakeholders, um, as well as civil society, is also another program that I want to commend. Um, all of these uh, will bear well in our efforts to advance climate change adaptation and mitigation, as well as we want to advance that environmental agenda of protecting um, our environment and our biodiversity. So um, I don't want to say too much more. I want to leave some of the rest for PS and our panelists to discuss. Uh, but I, I will just say as I close that I urge everyone, young, old, and in between, to become knowledgeable. Information is key. Information will, will help you, will guide you uh, to, to define your own place, your own role, and how you can participate, Miss Denise Henry um, and Miss Marcia, in, in advancing 
our goals, our collective goals. And so we're going to look on the strategies for sustainable development. Uh, we look at the use of green technology, such as solar and wind power and construction and other sectors. We look on preserving and in some cases rehabilitating ecological systems, including our forests, freshwater sources, wetlands, um, and marine life. We look on maintaining sustainable farming and fishing practices. And I think most importantly, um, Camilo, in making a conscious effort to reduce pollutants, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions um, and ozone depleting substances, and a conscious effort to, to change uh, in a positive way our, our thought process, how we think, how we act, will define the consequences and the results. So do what you can, where you can, to restore our ecosystems and preserve our environment. We owe it to ourselves as Jamaicans um, and to ourselves as global citizens. Thank you. God bless you all. Um, and I welcome Joni to take over moderation. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. We're also joined this afternoon by our permanent secretary, Dr. Alwin, Alwin, Alwin Hales, and he will be also addressing us. P.S. Hales. Oh, oh, thank you, Madam Moderator, Honorable Minister, ladies and gentlemen, all our guests across Jamaica. Let me extend a warm welcome to everyone for this webinar in celebration of National Environment, Environmental Awareness Week and World Environment Day. And to thank you all for your participation in what is one of the important events of the Ministry of Housing, Urban Renewal, Environment and Climate Change. I must also thank our presenters who have agreed to be with us today to educate and inform us about what their various organizations are doing to restore our ecosystems and to preserve our environment. Ladies and gentlemen, there's a fine line between Jamaica's economic development agenda and environmental preservation. Much of the impetus and collaborative work undertaken by the ministry since its inception in September of 2020 has been in pursuit of sustainable development agenda with the realization that the management of the environment and the planning issues is a cross-cutting theme which affects every sector and every person in the society. When ecosystems are degraded, it significantly reduces the ability of the residents of the communities in close proximity to improve their lives and livelihoods as well as their food and water security. It also limits their ability to protect themselves against natural hazards, which is becoming more and more critical given the adverse effects of a changing climate. The ministry through its environment and risk management branch and in association with its partners and stakeholders continues to draft advocate and promote policies and legislation that govern and protect the environment. We are putting in place the necessary policy measures to give teeth to the projects and programs aimed at improving our environment. However, if we are to be effective in changing the status quo and combating the degradation of our ecosystems in particular, and our environment in general, we must harness the power of the people in the most affected communities. We will all feel the impacts of a degraded environment, but those who live closely and rely on our natural resources for a living are most likely to suffer the, consequence, the consequences. As a nation, we are still coping with the impacts of, COVID, of the COVID-19 pandemic, However, any efforts at rebuilding, restoring, and renewing our island following the pandemic must also take into consideration a cleaner and a greener Jamaica. This will require that we all commit to changing our consumption behavior and contribute to the transformation 
that is needed to achieve a sustainable, to achieve sustainable development. There is strength in numbers and each one must teach one, but the crucial importance of the environment, about the crucial importance of the environment. As we move into the United Nations decade of ecosystems restoration, let us be mindful of and position ourselves to be great greener in our operations. Be more aware of the importance of our environment and better armed with the tools to rebuild and thrive our beloved country. I look forward to a fruitful session this afternoon and trust that we'll all benefit from what is to follow. Thank you. Thank you, P.S. Hales. We are now going to go into the meat of the matter and we will be having our presentations. Our first presenter is Mr. Camilo Trench. Mr. Trench is a marine biologist who is presently a lecturer in marine sciences and the academic coordinator at the University of the West Indies Discovery Bay Marine Laboratory. He has spent over 10 years studying mangrove rehabilitation in Jamaica and with his colleagues has collaborated with entities such as NEPA, the Forestry Department, the Environmental Foundation of Jamaica, Forest Conservation Fund, numerous environmental consultancy firms and NGOs, making him one of the island's primary consultants on mangrove ecology conservation and coastal forest rehabilitation. The title of his presentation is on route to mangrove restoration. Mr. Trench. Thank you very much, our host, um, Minister Charles. Pleasure seeing you again, sir. Um, P.S. Hales and all other protocols observe, my fellow guest. Um, thank you for sharing your depth of knowledge today. So today I will be speaking about Eco, uh, mangrove restoration, just giving you a little snippet of the type of work that I do and my, <clears throat> my job at University of the West Indies has allowed me the flexibility to study mangrove ecosystems as both staff and students. I'm quite fortunate, just recently completed my PhD, so thank you for the support. So what is, of course, you know, conservation is to retain what we have regarding mangrove forests and to promote national, natural regeneration. It's a, it's a worldwide priority. And we see that in the Ramsar Convention, we see it in establishment of marine protected areas, but it is a complex and often requires some expensive decisions. And an ecological mangrove restoration is the act of regaining the functions of the ecosystem by either reversing or correcting whatever physical factors is negatively affecting this area um, to pre-disturbance conditions. Now, rehabilitation is um, a partial um, reinstatement of the ecosystem. So rehabilitation will have a partial um, implementation of these features, but not a complete return to the pre-disturbance conditions. So if I look at the Jamaican context with the efforts of ecologists, resource managers, etc. We want mangrove forests that are healthy. Um, of course, we want them in the optimal state with maximizing human benefits. Now, Robin Lewis is one of the foremost experts on mangrove restoration, and I am a, one of his scholars. And so we have three types of mangrove restoration identified by Mr. Robin Lewis. Or the late Dr. Robin Lewis. Planting alone, we call it mangrove gardening, which is the least successful. And I, I'm happy I could use this forum to just emphasize to everyone online and our other colleagues that planting a mangrove alone will not guarantee any success. That's the least successful type. We have excavation and fill, and we also have hydrological restoration. So here's an example of mangrove gardening. And studies have shown that worldwide, Mangrove gardening is very unsuccessful because persons believe that just by putting a mangrove in the ground, it's going to live. There, if the mangrove wasn't there, more than likely there is a good reason for it not to be there. Okay? And persons, um, like the picture you see here, plant mangroves in rows like it's corn. No, you don't do that. You want to, when you're doing a mangrove restoration, you want it to be natural. So studies all over the world have shown that um, mangrove gardening is very unsuccessful. 
and um, in Sri Lanka, Philippines, etc. Different researchers have shown that, and in Jamaica as well. And admittedly, I myself, in my early years of mangrove restoration, killed quite a few mangroves as well before I really understood it properly. Yes, even the palisades we're on this morning, I planted my first batch of mangroves on the palisades without doing anything else, and all of them died. But now we have um, cracked that code, and we are a lot better many years later. So replanting can show success if it is combined with other inputs. So for example, on the palisades, which Minister Charles was planting mangroves this morning, is not planting alone. We're combining it with fencing the mangroves and the whole management that went into it. So seedlings are not always needed for mangrove restoration. In fact, most mangrove restoration projects do not need seedlings. Okay, and I was telling Minister Charles this morning that with a mangrove restoration, you plant one tree, but in about three or four years, you get thousands of trees. Because if you allow the conditions to be right, then that adult mangrove will produce thousands of seedlings. So when do we use seedlings? When there's a lack of mature trees, like the palisados. The palisados has a solid waste issue, so you need seedlings out there. Sometimes there are harsh environmental factors, and sometimes you need the mature saplings to speed it up and often to arrest things like erosion and tidal control. And I'm proud to say the University of the West Indies has, was the first to establish mangrove nurseries in Jamaica. That's a Port Royal Mangrove Nursery. We also have a mangrove nursery in Discovery Bay. And as much as we like to sell seedlings, we like to advise persons, let us have a comprehensive look at your restoration project first before you put the seedlings in the ground and, and they die. So it's a complicated process. Here's, here's, here's an example of excavation and fill. And I was happy to do this project in collaboration with the um, Forest Conservation Fund. Thank you to them for their years of support. So often we have to survey the area before we go in. So here we see the surveyor working, then the excavator came in, but the area was too high. And when we scraped it down to the right level, month zero, not much, month 12, you see them growing. And in month 24, wow, look at that. In two years, you can see you have mangrove seedlings, which are like chest high. And that's what it looked like um, about two years ago. Now, walking in there, it, the canopy is almost full. So we can say it was a successful mangrove restoration down there in Montego Bay. And that's an aerial view of the area after two years of growth. So you can see that same spot. And I use the, the yellow star there to indicate the one parent tree that was there. You can see it's almost completely filled in. So um, we use these aerial um, monitoring to monitor the projects. That's very useful as well. So we use technology, have to. Then another excavation and fill, we did that in Lilliput, um, well, right at the St. James, Trelawney border. We excavated this area, about 45 truckloads of material came out. Thanks to Forest Conservation Fund again for funding this. Again, we restored the hydrology. So it was dry, now it's wet. And then this area, I don't have any pictures of the ceilings, but they're about two years old and they're quite happy. However, years like these, this section adjacent to it actually isn't government owned land. This is a private owned development. So years like these will need some attention because there's nothing legally stopping the developer from saying, hey, I want to develop this for a hotel. So we have some work to do, even though we're making a lot of progress. Um, here, this is a NEPA project, Winsmaras, which um, the contracted University of West Indies to do, excavated again. And um, the ceilings there are quite doing quite well. Um, it was about half acre. Um, we had to bring in trucks, excavators. And studies have shown that when you actually excavate the site, it teases the soil and allows greater aeration. So the mangrove ceilings actually do a lot better than the compacted soil that was there for years and years. So as you can see, ecological hydrology, um, restoring ecology, ecological and hydrological restoration is another um, Method, it can be very cost effective. It can be something as simple as placing a culvert to restore water into an area, um, as we've seen in the US and worldwide. And one other thing that I want to highlight to the members online today and my fellow panelists is that mangroves do not require 100% wetting. It's a big misconception. Mangroves require, well, their ideal conditions are 70% dry 30% wet. So they get their wetting when the tide comes in. So we do not put the mangroves in very deep water. And here's an example down in Jackson Bay. This is a project that Sodico is working on. The university is very pleased to have 
um, inform them on the initial diagnosis of this area. And that beach, that mangrove area, you can see eerily. You can see the difference in color. That area was completely dying because of a road. And it's a road without a culvert. So it shows how important planning is. So often we do development and we do not plan for the ecosystem around it. So by missing a culvert, this era was dying. So um, immediately after visiting the era, I said to them, well, it needs a culvert and it will be fixed. Now they have since put in larger culverts and it's doing a lot better than three years ago, but it shows the importance of planning. So not only planning for your building and your infrastructure for your citizens, but also for keeping the ecosystem um, in its natural state. Of course, we do have a plastic problem and we also have large and microplastics and Kingston is the great context to show you what not to do with your plastics. And I like to, uh, one of my favorite sentences is, especially to children, do not teach your garbage to swim. And in Kingston, we teach our garbage to swim a whole lot in the gullies, etc. So we do need to do a lot of um, solid waste reduction and much mitigation and, and enforcement is needed in that department and from a national and international level. The reality is, let's all remember that plastics were created for profit and, and um, convenience, but we don't need um, single-use plastics. We used to live without it. It's going to be very hard to turn back, but it's possible a world without it again. Might be several decades, but it's possible. So in urban settlement, um, urban settings like the Palisades, we do need um, solid waste segregation. Here you see a picture of um, the mangrove site, not the one that we're doing currently. This is one of the older ones when the Palisades River was just put in. And here we see that copious amount of solid waste on the outside after a heavy shower of rain. It's very frightening, isn't it? And that was after one night of rain. So imagine if all that garbage was just allowed to infiltrate the mangrove wetlands. And my PhD study showed that plastic bags are the worst. So the move we have to ban plastic bags, that's definitely a step in the right direction. Uh, when, once, once a plastic bag gets wrapped around a mangrove ceiling, it has almost zero chance of survival, whether it's a small amount or a large amount. So interestingly, on the Palisados, of the four sites that I studied, the Palisados had the largest amount of flowers and fruits on the mangrove trees but they did not survive because they had to contend with plastics and other pollutants. So that tells a very damning story, I think. So do, do Jamaican citizens appreciate these mangrove green spaces? Well, you tell me, absolutely, I think they do. The dozens of music videos that have been filmed on the Palisados just in that green space. Imagine the Palisados is four miles long. So why do people film their music videos and their adverts in that one spot? because it's green and I'm very happy to watch on TV and see, and even movies, the Sprinter movie, I was into Sprinter movie and seeing the mangrove forest that you will help to restore right there in the background because people appreciate these green spaces. And mangroves have over 200 uses. So the aesthetic value, how it looks and how it makes people feel just being in the area is of tremendous value as well. In fact, there's a community in Florida that very rich community in Naples. They spent millions of dollars to restore a mangrove forest that was dying next to their high-rise apartment because the dying mangroves never looked that good. So their, their property value was going down. So think about Bogue in Montego Bay in the hills, looking down at the mangrove forest. Imagine if that's all gone, then of course it doesn't have as much value anymore. So thank you very much for listening. And I hope I didn't take too much of your time and give you too much um, mangrove nerd stuff. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Camilo. And um, well, I don't know if I'm speaking for everybody, but um, you didn't take too much of our time and it was a very interesting presentation. So we're going to move on to our next presentation. And this one, I'm actually very personally interested in because I'm from that end of the island. It is titled IW Eco Jamaica, Restoring the Negro Great Morass, Fixing the Flow. This presentation will be made by Ms. Lorene Jones, a marine ecologist by training. Lorene Jones possesses over 15 years of demonstrated experience working in the environmental services 
with expertise concentrated on natural resources management and project management. She's the project manager for the integrating water, land, and ecosystems management in Caribbean Small Island Developing States project in Jamaica. IW Eco Jamaica, restoring the Negro Great Morass, fixing the flow, the regions. I was muted, sorry for that. Thanks again, Joni. Um, good day, Minister. Um, PS, or oh, CTD is gone. Um, thank you all for having me today. And welcome to all our participants online. Um, today I'll be speaking about the IW Eco project, IW Eco Jamaica. So the integrated water, land, and ecosystems management in Caribbean, small island developing states is a regional project. It's been implemented in 10 countries in the Caribbean, and Jamaica is one of those countries. Our national sub-project is called Biodiversity Mainstreaming in Coastal Landscapes within the Negril Environmental Protection Area. Okay, I thought it was frozen for a while. Um, so the, the, our project site is the Negril Environmental Protection Area, which is around 271 square kilometers. And it, this area was designated in 1997 as an as an area of, in, of environmental interest. The project has been funded by the Global Environment Facility and also for, by the government of Jamaica. Um, the Global Environmental Facility gave us, we are in receipt of 3.1 million US dollars to implement activities under the project. So you may wonder why this project. Um, this project came about because the morass, which is the main focus of the project, is, is, is in threat. It's been threatened by drainage, which was done back in the 40s, the late 40s, early 50s, canals were put in place to drain the wetland. And, us, and in doing that, it was, we were very successful of draining the wetland and that, that caused a change in ecosystem services that, was, that is provided by the area. There's also unsustainable agricultural practices in the area which has, re, which has reclaimed a lot of the area and now so the area is dry. You would have heard Mr. Mr. Camilla speak about that wetlands need hydrology, need some water. But the area now is too the area now is too dry, so it's not performing the same functions as before. So there's been a drop in the water levels, and now we have more peat, more more fires in the area. And one thing that is unique about the mar, the, the Great Morass is that it's the it's it's a peat morass. So you know that peat is peat can be flammable, and with the reduction in the level of water in the area, the area is now dry. So it's it's a big problem for the residents and the stakeholders in the area. So in general, the general objective of the project is to promote conservation and restoration of wetland ecosystem services. But more specifically, uh, we're required to restore the hydrology and the functionality of the morass, um, reestablish vegetation, eliminate issues that degrade the ecosystem functions. So um, with, with reclamation, there was more dry land now for people to start building. So we've in, we, we have degraded the ecosystem more than just with, with just the draining. We also need to implement institutional arrangements to ensure long-term sustainability. So the project is required to train the stakeholders in the area and uh, improve their capacities to manage the area and also so that there'll be more, there'll be project sustainability. So once the project ends, there'll be the, the activities implemented on the project will be continued because the community is now empowered to actually conduct monitoring and evaluations on their resources. All of these activities on the project, when they're implemented, fulfill a bigger role for Jamaica and also internationally and locally. The project will assist the government to fulfill some of its national and international obligations and also assist NEPA in fulfilling its mandate of managing the country's ecosystem and as a planning agency, spatial planning. It will also assist us in fulfilling some of the areas to assist us is on the Vision 2030 goal, goal 4 outcome 12, 13, 14, and 15. It fulfills some of our obligations under the Ramsar Convention, which we work towards wise use of all wetlands. It also fulfills our obligations under the Convention on Biological Diversity, which is ensure conservation of biodiversity. So it's, there's an overarching picture. We feel we're, we're, we're not just doing stuff just for Negril alone, it's for Jamaica, and to fulfill requirements um, internationally as well. We are also be fulfilling some of the sustainable development goals. 
number six, 13, 14, and 15 that you will see there on your screen. So the project is being implemented on the four components, um, integrated approaches to land management, improvement of water, land ecosystem, and biodiversity resources, strengthening of policies and legal institutional frameworks, and also communication and awareness. We can't have all of these activities being undertaken without ensuring that the information is out there to empower people that of what to do and what not to do within the space and within Jamaica in general. So while we are underground collecting data, we also have to disseminate the information to get the, the, the behavior change that's required to ensure that the, the efforts are sustained, sustained into the future. So some of the consultants being implemented under component one. These include a hydrological assessment where under this um, consultancy, the solutions are being investigated that can be implemented to restore the hydro, to, re, to, to, to rehydrate the wetland. There's also a wetland assessment of the wetlands that are within the EPA, not just the Maras, there are other wetlands within the, within the EPA as well that are, are being assessed to, to, prop, to prepare management plans that, on how to manage those areas as well. Some are in private, private, privately owned, some are on public land, but we all need to ensure we know what's there and what we can and how to go about restoring it. There's also the drone program, which will empower the people to um, conduct the research that's needed, um, the monitoring and access to enforcement. There's also going to be an, an, an assessment of the impact of approved development on the environment. That is that will tell us how we have been operating and how, what we need to change and how we need to go forward. There's also going to be a reassessment of the height, density and setback limits of the Negril, of the confirmed Negril and Green Island area development order. Um, so all of those component one and component two are where we have most of the, the fact finding missions occurring, where we have most of the assessments being conducted and the implementation of some of those activities will start on a component two as well, where we have ecosystem restoration activities that will, that will be conducted. So while we will have the seagrass assessments, bisnock assessments, those are all coming with recommendations on how, of how to restore the, the ecosystem. There will be an, an assessment of the morass, and that will also come, come along with a program and to recommend which invasive species are there that need to be controlled. Um, there's also be a green business initiative that should be started in, in a few months that will engage, engage business owners and operators to determine, to see how they currently interact with the environment and how they can do it better. This is all with their input, it's not being forced on them because it will be unique to their individual, individual experiences on the ground and, and how they operate their businesses. So as I was saying, we have several consultants have been undertaking now the drone program to increase the capacity to monitor, monitor and enforce using technology. The reassessment of the high tendency to set back limits um, to address planning and development issues because we know that there's limited space on Jamaica, especially in, in the grill. And, we, and the agency NEPA, who's implementing the project has been getting um, requests for improved heights in the in the in the Negril area. So this study is going to ask us to see if it's possible and what is possible and how we can move forward to propose new developments that can that can occur within the area and, and if it's possible. There's also the Wistinok assessment. This is one of our charismatic pieces that we have in Jamaica. It's limit, it's 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 globally threatened. It's a globally threatened species that is mostly found in the western part of Jamaica. Um, and this is this species is found primarily in the Great Morass and also within the Black River area. So there's this assessment being conducted to see what's happening with the habitat, what, what do we need to do? So while this project is a restoration project, it's also a biodiversity project. So we have to maintain and take into consideration what's happening, what, is, what do species need to survive? Um, so lot of, a lot of the species may just need a little more, like the duck, the, we have to ensure that there's enough um, habitat for them, wading areas, because this dot doesn't like a lot of deep water. So we have to ensure that we have ponds that have sloping sides and things like that to ensure that the dot, this dot can survive. The seagrass assessment is to determine what we have now in Long Bay and Bloody Bay to do, and also to propose areas that need to be restored because we can also do seagrass restoration. It's a, it's a bit trickier and more time consuming than the mangrove restoration. However, it can be done. 
but this is to inform us of what's, what has been happening, what is the current status, and how can we restore this ecosystem that is also required to ensure that we have to protect the, protect the coastlines, not just mangroves, but cor coral, sea grass, and mangroves all help to protect the coastline from, 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 from storms and storm surges. So this is also another important ecosystem that we have to get it right and to ensure that we have around. As I said, the hydrological assessment that will identify appropriate um, mechanisms that can be used to restore the Negri Great Morass and also the wetland assessment. The corporate social responsibility will be engaging the community. And then we also have plans to restore the Negri Great, the Royal Palm Reserve that is located in a section of the Morass. So this area has been. Um, non-functional for several years now. It used to be an area where you could go and there's a boardwalk that goes through the property, you could go and view the ecosystems. But if you go early enough, you can go and do bird watching. And there is also an interpretive center that was used as an educational outreach, educational outreach center. So we're, we're currently determining the consultants have prepared a draft business and marketing plan that's been reviewed now. There will be public consultations um, where the, the public and the stakeholders within the EPA can get a chance to have their voices heard to say, well, we agree with this or we don't agree with this. And so we're trying to restore this era for the stakeholders that they can go and be at one in nature, again, in another open space, not just in concrete areas, and have somewhere to go and relax and be at one with nature. So all of the activities that I mentioned before, they all feed into the greater aim of restoring the morass. So while it may not seem as if it's an important thing, because you also have to update the management plan for the area, wet loose management plan, the height and density assessments, the impact of development, the land tenure assessments, we have to conduct all of these um, fact planning missions, as I'm calling them, to then start the restoration, because restoration includes controlling invasive alien species, um, planting seedlings for restoration and for replanting. It wouldn't be mangroves per se, but we are planting back species that are native to the morass to ensure that we get back the canopy and the and the diversity that was there before logging took place and remove some of some of those species so you don't have heard me mention before that our project is, is helping nepa and the, and the country in general to fulfill some of their obligations as you see it here all the consultants is feeding to nepa's mandate which then feeds into the national and international agreements and treaties that we have signed on to and all help to fulfill our obligations under these conventions and the, the, the sustainable development goals and goals that have been set locally for Jamaica as well. So it's not just a random project. It, everything has a bigger goal. So once we all play our part, we all help to help, we all help to, to, to fulfill the big vision of restoration for future generations. So the key outcomes of the project, restore the hydrology, remove invasive alien species, um, do the land use surveys so that we know how to prevent the interactions, the negative interactions um, that occur when land, when, when land is not used efficiently or wisely, and also to do the interpretive center at the Negro Royal Palm Reserve. There's also the the plans to develop and pilot an integrated pollution control and management program. As you would have heard Trench say that pollution is a big thing, especially solid waste. So in our project as well, there's also that aim to do that. That, be, that, that one route of doing that is to improve farming practices. Um, so you would know that if there's an over, over, over use of pesticides, that runs off into the environment. And with the, and with the morass net, being able to conduct some of the functions as in retaining water and removing some of the pollutants before it reaches the sea. Then when it goes to the sea, it causes problems along the coastline. It causes an overgrowth of algae and it may which overgrow the seagrass. So there's a trickle down effect. Everything is all connected. So once we are able to fix one area, so there's a trickle down effect where everything else will feed off it in a positive way. And I will leave you with this that. Only with e healthy ecosystems can we improve people's livelihoods, prevent climate change, and stop the destruction. We can't turn back time, but we can succeed at restoration if everyone plays a role. Thank you. 
Thanks, Lorene, for your presentation. And as Lorene said, healthier ecosystems equal healthier people and a healthier planet. For those of you who joined us before, sorry, not before, after the start, I just want to let you know that we are taking all the questions after all the presentations. So all the questions that are in the chat, so we're not ignoring you, but we're going to get to the questions in the discussion segment. So we're going to move to our next presentation. We've heard about seagrass, mangroves, and now we're going to be talking a little bit about coral reefs. This presentation will be made by Mrs. Marcia, Marcia Query Ford. Mrs. Query Ford is a marine scientist with over 30 years experience working on various aspects of the Jamaican marine and coastal environment, including oceanography, mangrove and wetland ecology, environmental impact assessments, and marine biodiversity. As the environmental data manager, in the U.S. Center of Marine Sciences, she specializes in data management, coral reef monitoring, and research on the impacts of climate change on the reef ecosystem. And her presentation is titled Coral Reef Restoration, a Solution for Jamaica. Marcio. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we're hearing you loud and clear. Okay. Great. Um, Honorable Minister Charles, um, P.S. Whit Hales, moderator, fellow presenters, and participants. Um, it, it's an honor to be invited to make this presentation here in celebration of National Environmental Awareness Week and Environment Awareness Day tomorrow. So my presentation is on coral reef restoration a solution for Jamaica. And we will see whether this is actually something that can be used as a solution for Jamaica. So let us start at the beginning. What are coral reefs? I think most people may be aware, but coral reefs are colonial organisms and they're comprised of individual coral polyps. They're reforming cor corals that they are the ones that form or lay down the coral calcium, ca coral, sorry, calcium carbonate skeleton that form the, the solid structures of the reefs. And where are these reefs found? Well, they occur on the coast of tropical and subtropical regions. So you won't find them in temperate or Arctic regions. They're only found in the tropical and subtropical regions. And why are corals really important? Well, they're important because they support a vast diversity of species. In fact, they support approximately 4,000 species of fish and 8,000, uh, sorry, 800 types of corals. And what is sort of unique about this is that corals cover only 1% of the Earth's surface, but they are home to 25% of marine species. So corals provide a number of ecosystem services, which possibly we take for granted, but these services provide a lot of eco economic benefit to, to all of us. So regulating services, they provide shoreline protection and erosion irregulation, just to name a few. They provide support in providing habitat for a number of economically important species, and they're also home of a quite um, diverse set of, of, of um, species. Culturally, they're a source of recreation, research, education, and of course, they're aesthetic, aesthetically um, pleasing. And they also provide us with food and medicine. Many drugs come from marine organisms found on the coral reefs. But these coral reefs are in threats, and there are a number of threats that they are facing, local threats from overfishing, pollution, coastal development, coral disease, and most recently there has been the advent of stony coral tissue loss disease, which has wiped out a lot of the major massive corals um, throughout the Caribbean, Florida and the Caribbean. There's also invasive species, and all of us are very familiar with the lionfish. That was really a serious problem a few years ago. And also, you have coral predators, such as damselfish and fireworm, that feed on the corals. 
The other major threat um, to coral reefs is, of course, climate change. And the two main things that impact corals um, are increased sea surface temperature, which cause coral bleaching and sometimes death. As you can see on the left, there is a coral there which, partially, which is partially bleached. Also, ocean acidification. This is a decrease in pH, which prevents corals from calcifying um, and also dissolve shells of other marine organisms. This is a sort of new and emerging impact from climate change, which affects not only the corals, animals with shells, but also fish and other species as well. So when we look at the um, Jamaican corals, here is a map showing the location and status of coral reefs in Jamaica. Now in the map, all those dark areas around the coast are where we have coral reefs. So you will note that most of our coral reefs are along the north coast with some along the um, south coast in Portland Bight area, St. Thomas and some other areas. In a recent report from NEPA, the coral reef health status report of 2020, it shows that our coral reefs are not really in a good state at all. We can see that 76% of our corals are either in poor or critical condition with only 23% being fair and none, no, no percentage, zero percentage um, being good or very good, which it represents a general decline over the last say 10 years of the health of corals in Jamaica. So what is being done about this? Now, you have heard from various presenters before that we are, Jamaica is supporting the action of a lot of these global and, and regional um, initiatives, such as the Convention on Biodiversity, the Climate Change um, Convention, the UN Ocean Decade, and the Decade of Ecosystem Restoration. So we have to support those global efforts, but also locally, we have to reduce land-based sources of pollution and sedimentation. We have to establish marine protected um, areas and support those areas. But one other action that can be taken is um, restoration. So let's look at this idea of restoration. Now, why do we want to do restoration? Mainly because lo local conservation measures and natural recovery process have not worked. And um, Camilla Trench alluded to that in his presentation. So what has happened is that researchers and managers are now turning to active restoration. So the, the objective of the restorations tend to be varied, but invariably they involve human intervention through the manipulation of the coral reef habitat. But restoration is only one of the ecosystem management um, tools available to coral reef scientists. It's just one, and it's not the panacea. Um, when we look at the coral reef restoration projects that have been undertaken in Jamaica, as you can imagine, most of them are on the North Coast. And this map shows, um, it's not uh, um, totally up to date, but it shows the areas, the main areas where coral restoration projects and activities have taken place. Now, there are a number of motivation, number of uh, things that motivate people to undertake these restoration projects. They might be want to accelerate recovery in a particular area. They want to reestablish the functioning of a reef east ecosystem. They um, <clears throat> want to mitigate the decline of any species, any population of any particular species. They want to manage those endangered species and some of the coral reefs that as coral species that we have are listed on the IUCN endangered species list. They want to establish self-sustaining breeding population. Also on the socioeconomic side, the promotion of alternative livelihood for fishers and persons living in coastal communities and the promotion of local conservation stewardship that um, local communities you know, are interested in looking after their environment. So their, the restoration techniques employed, they kind of fall into two broad categories physical restoration and biological restoration. 
Physical restoration usually includes coral relocation and the use of artificial substrates or artificial reefs. And biological um, restoration usually involves coral gardening or lab rearing of corals. So in terms of physical um, restoration and coral relocation, we have three main areas in Jamaica where coral re relocate, relocation has taken place at Rackham's Key Fal and Falmouth and Discovery Bay. And in all three cases, areas of corals were, were removed. And what was done as part of the mitigation measure for these projects was that these corals had to be relocated in an area for where they would survive, so they would not be destroyed. And <clears throat> follow-up studies shown, have shown that there is a, a, a level of survivorship from these coral restoration um, relocation projects. The other type of relo, um, restoration projects involve artificial reefs. And these are structures of various designs and so on, made of various materials, some ceramic, some um, cement, some steel, that are, are placed on the seafloor and provide a, a substrate for corals to be either attached or for coral um, to settle on. And so these are the main types that have been used in Jamaica, reef balls, um, bio rock, eco reefs, um, the air module, Acropora iron, iron reef module. Um, this was designed by the, the late Peter Gale from Discover Bay. And the modular turbulence generator model, which was designed by Andrew Ross, um, a well-known coral reef restoration practitioner. When we, we go on to now um, establishing nurseries. Nurseries are, as you can see, they're equivalent to like plant nurseries where you have um, the seedlings growing and then when they reach a certain size, you transplant them out to their final destination. So various techniques have been used to grow very small fragments of corals until they reach a certain size and then they are able to be planted out. So we have um, the A-frame, we have some corals on a disc, and, and you also have this midwater nursery with little coral nubbins put on golf tees to, to help them grow. And this also keeps away predators and sediments and, and things that would sort of inhibit the growth of coral, small fragments of corals. So also you have, you know, it's a progressive thing. So they move from those techniques to know the line and rope nurseries where basically it's like a clothesline and they attach the corals to it. They're suspended off the bottom and they are allowed to grow. And once they reach a certain size, these corals are um, transplanted onto the reef. You will note that in the, in the middle um, image where it says set and forget, this was um, also a design by Andrew Ross, where he, he, um, the, the corals are attached to the rope in a vertical way. And once they get heavy, they just fall to the substrate. And so there's no real need for transplanting them. They just self transplant right there. So these are the, the um, line and rope nurseries. And from the line and rope, we move to the Christmas tree or the coral tree nurseries. And this is, as it is said, something that looks like a Christmas tree with a vertical trunk and branches. And this can hold a lot more um, specimens of corals and, and it's in a confined space, so it's easier to manage. And we haven't had a lot of, a, a number of them, um, you know, been established at Boscobel, Bluefields, Discover Bay, alligator head and some of them are used to grow the slow, the fast growing corals at cervicornis, acropora cervicornis and acropora palmata, while others are used to grow the, the less, um, the slower growing massive corals such as Mantastra, Favillata and Sedastra sideria. So it's two, two sets of um, coral growth forms that are um, grown in these nurseries. And of course, uh, 
at the end of the nursery process, they have to be outplanted as in a land-based nursery. And so we have out, um, corals outplanted in Aracabessa and also Discovery Bay. And these um, nursery grown corals can either be outplanted directly onto the substrate or they can be outplanted on some artificial reefs or fixed structure um, that helps them to, to give them support. So in addition to that, you also have to do, or there, there have also been attempts to rear um, the corals in the lab by collecting the gametes at sea and transferring them to a holding tank where they are fertilized and they would settle out and then they would grow to a certain size um, before they are outplanted in the wild. And UE has also been involved in genetic research to sort of decide, de um, determine which um, coral species are more sort of tolerant and hardy that can survive, you know, the impacts of climate change. So work has been also been done on that. So there are a lot of challenges facing coral reef restoration. First of all, the location, you have to have the right location, the physical oceanography, the water chemistry, the benthic composition has to be ideal for the corals to survive. And of course, there's the environmental conditions of water quality. Algal growth is a major problem along um, on a number of our reefs predation and of course bleaching and disease and hurricanes and storms. We also have issue with human and financial resources because project funding tends not to be for the long term. These activities are extremely labor intensive and require diving, which is a specialized um, you know, skill. Also equipment and supplies are quite expensive and just to work out the logistics of getting a boat, getting divers, getting gas, getting out there, the weather and so on and so forth. It is quite a challenge. And the additional challenge is that documentation is quite limited. So information on a number of these things are mainly in project reports. And you know, once a project is done, the report gets put on a shelf. And usually there is no long-term monitoring. So maybe the project is for, maybe the project is for a, a number of years, a few years. However, there's no long-term monitoring to say after five years, 10 years, do, are these corals still alive? And also coral restoration in itself is largely an experimental and evolving scientific field. And so things change quite rapidly. So in coral reef restoration, how do you measure success? You know, how do you know whether your restoration activity is a success? Things that are measured include growth rates, survival in the nursery, survival at the outplant site, and the area, the physical aerial extent of the reef restored. And to be able to judge all of this documentation is very important. And as I've said, this is one of the sort of weaknesses in this whole process. But where do we go from here? My suggestions are that we need to have guidelines for coral relocation and restoration in Jamaica so that you know everybody who thinks it's, it's nice and sexy and cute can't just set up a restoration project, do it for a year or two, and then you know it gets too boring or they have some, they've moved on to something else. So we have to have a plan for the island. Where do we want to restore? Where are the best locations? Where do we focus on? What are the best species to use? And so on. So we have to have specific objectives for our restoration activity. We can't just do it, you know, because it's nice and it's the thing. No, restoration, coral restoration is a big thing now. Um, we have to so to get the right restoration technique for the objectives and there has to be monitoring and reporting. And of course we need the human resources. We need the experts, but we also need the volunteers and the communities to be involved. And of course we need sustainable finances, financing because without it, all of the above will not be able to be accomplished. And also we need the ongoing research. Some of the research activities do not always provide positive outcome, but the negative outcome is also important because then it says, well, okay, that's not the way to go, even though it had seemed feasible in the start. So in closing, 
I want to rec us to recognize that coral restoration is a new and evolved, evolving scientific field. We are actually work learning by doing, and we are also sharing our experiences. But to say that restoration is not the answer for coral reefs, it's just a sort of holding them and keeping them. It's like putting them in hospital or so on until you know the the, the environmental issues that made their decline um, are are resolved, and that's where participating in these global um, initiatives is important. So this is just a list of organizations and persons that have been involved in this assessment, and I would like to acknowledge them at this point. Thank you. Thanks, Marcia, for a very informative presentation. We're going to go to our final presentation, and then we will get to our discussion segment. Our next presenter is Ms. Denise Henry. She's a marine ecologist and is currently the research program manager at the Alligator Head Foundation, a marine conservation nonprofit based in Portland. Denise has worked on ecosystem restoration projects throughout her career, establishing and maintaining coral, seagrass, and mangrove nurseries at the Discovery Bay Marine Laboratory, St. Anne, and at the Alligator Head Foundation. During her tenure at the Alligator Head Foundation, she and her team have planted over 4,000 coral fragments, established a land-based coral nursery and state-of-the-art wet lab, developed and implemented a sea turtle protection and conservation program, introduced mangroves to the secondary school curriculum through the Jamming Project at two high schools in Port Antonio, among other projects. Her presentation is titled, The Life Begins at the Beach, the story of sea turtle restoration in the East Portland Fish Sanctuary. Denise. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Are you hearing me? Yes, we're hearing you. Okay, so... I would like to acknowledge Minister Charles, P.S. Hales, all our panelists and our participants who joined us for these talks today, and to thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Today, I will be speaking about sea turtles whose life begins on the beach. And this is the story of sea turtle restoration in the East Portland Fish Sanctuary. One second. So one might ask, why sea turtles? Now, these animals are considered to be living dinosaurs, and they are large air-breathing reptiles that are commonly found in tropical and subtropical waters, such as those surrounding Jamaica. And they are important because these animals maintain many marine ecosystems globally. There were typically four types of turtles that were found in Jamaican waters, and I'm going to very briefly go through them. The leatherback sea turtle, which was known to be the largest of the turtle species, which can grow to 1,500 pounds and about six feet in length. And it's unique in that its shell is not composed of hard keratin, but instead it has a thick leathery skin as its shell. These animals eat jellyfish, and so they function, part of their function is to control jellyfish populations. Moving on to the loggerhead sea turtle, they are known for their extremely large heads, which is an adaptation for their feeding preference, which is hard shell prey, such as conch and bivalves. They are known to carry small colonies of plants and animals on their back, and they can grow to about 400 pounds or four feet in length. The green sea turtle, another very popular sea turtle that was found in Jamaican waters, is known to reside in seagrass beds and maintain these beds as part of their function. They are the only herbivorous turtle that is known and they grow to be about 400 pounds or four feet in length as well. And finally, the hawksbill sea turtle, which is known for its unique hawk-like bill or beak, 
and it's the smallest of the Jamaican sea turtles growing to about 150 pounds or about three feet in length. Now, these very majestic animals have had a dramatic decrease in their population in the last few decades. And this is often as a result of human interventions. This drastic reduction in their population has rendered them to be considered endangered. Sorry, my apologies. The human threats that are affecting these animals are poaching, the illegal killing and consumption of turtle flesh and eggs, as seen in the pictures that were locally obtained, as well as improper disposal of solid waste. Now in the image on your screen, you're seeing a turtle that's eating a plastic bag. This turtle has confused that plastic bag as a jellyfish and would consume it and would eventually die as the plastic gets entangled in their internal organs. This dramatic decline in their population has rendered this species, this, these animals to be endangered or in danger of becoming extinct. And as a result, actions have been taken to protect the turtle populations. In Jamaica, they are protected under law, and by law, it is an offense to have sea turtles in one's possession, whether whole or part, living or dead. This includes adults, turtles, hatchlings, shells, meat, eggs, and all other turtle products, for example, turtle shell craft and jewelry. And I know in some cases, some of this information might be familiar, but not all of it. Any part of a turtle living or dead is illegal under Jamaican law. They are protected under two acts. One is the Wildlife Protection Act, which has a penalty of $100,000 or up to 12 months in prison. And there is the Fisheries Act, which protects all wildlife in a protected area and carries a penalty of $3 million or up to two years in prison. Another action that has been taken is the protection and restoration of sea turtle populations by organizations such as the Alligator Head Foundation and many others across the island, such as the Arakabesa Foundation, the Urban Development Corporation, and many other of our sanctuary partners. To carry out this protection, there are a number of activities that we go through. The first of which is nesting monitoring. And this involves going out on nesting beaches during nighttime hours to look for active nesting turtles and to protect them. We are protecting these turtles from human activities, which include poaching, which is an extreme, but also smaller activities, such as the lighting of bonfires on beaches, the use of bright lights in developed areas, which are deterrents for turtles to come up and nest. There are other deterrents, other natural deterrents, such as wildlife being on the beach, stray dogs, for instance, which will scare nesting turtles off of a beach. And these turtles have a small window during which they are able to and comfortable enough to lay their hatch of eggs. So being able to protect them to be able to safely and comfortably lay that hatch is one way we are actively restoring or trying to restore the population. During these monitoring activities, we also collect metrics of the turtles that are nesting, and this contributes to our general knowledge of the turtle population throughout Jamaica. We, of course, cannot monitor all the beaches all the time. So there is also daytime monitoring during which we patrol the same beaches and look for new nests, nests that may have been laid when no one was on the beach. We're looking at these nests for the condition of the nests and to identify them. Now in the picture on your screen, if you're seeing it clearly, you will see a nest, but it's flooded with water. And this happened overnight. This was a newly laid nest, which with the high tide rising became flooded. Now, when there are hazards such as this or other hazards, um, like the root intrusion that's also present. Hi. 
Hi, everybody. Um, we still have lost Denise, so how's it better? Just give her a hi. Sorry. Um, so while the team is on the beach, they will also monitor older nests, nests that had been laid previously, to see that there are no hazards affecting these nests, such as runoff from other, from developments on the beach, or, and they'll look for hatchling development, how far along in the process of incubation are these eggs. After an incubation period, which lasts between 55 days in warmer months to up to 90 days in colder months, the team then assists these newly hatched baby turtles in their first hazardous experience, which is the emergence from the nest and the crawl across the beach back in to, in, into the water. During this process, it is estimated that about 10% of the nest will perish. And this is as a result of hazards such as predation. As they're crawling across the beach, these turtles are vulnerable to birds, crabs, again, stray animals like dogs. They are often disoriented by light pollution and they may become entangled in solid waste as is in the image on your screen where they get trapped between bags in the plastic cup and so they are trapped and end up dehydrating on the beach and never make it out to sea. As a result of all of these hazards, the presence of our team on the beach during this emergence process enables all the hatchlings that have completely developed to make it out of the nest and safely across the beach. And as a result of our efforts, in the last three years since the inception of the program, we have protected 129 nests and assisted 8,762 hatchlings to make the journey out of nest, across the beach and into the ocean. And this is just the figure for this organization, not counting the many other organizations that are doing similar work. An additional outcome is increased sightings of turtles within the protected area at various stages of development. And the pictures that you're seeing on the screen are pictures that were taken within the protected area within this last year. Up to yesterday, we had divers that saw two large turtles who were very docile. Um, and we have about 10 adolescent turtles that are now resident in one of our bays. So there is a return of turtles resident to the area in various states of development. It is estimated that one in 1000 hatchlings survive from the nest to adulthood. And through our efforts, we are working to increase that number and support the mission of the foundation, which is to restore the East Portland Fish Sanctuary. And with that, I'm gonna leave you with a short video of these baby turtles making that walk across the beach and beginning their life. Thank you for your attention and I'm open to any questions. Thank you for your presentation, Denise, and for your video. And we are now going to go into our discussion segment. So we have some questions in the chat, and we're going to go through those first. And then if you have a question, you can raise your hand, and then I will acknowledge you. In addition to our panelists, we also have Mr. Anthony McKenzie from NEPA on the call. So if there are any questions that are more of his alley, he will respond. So we have a question from Damian Salmon, and this was after Minister's message, and he asked, what about the massive government sanctioned mangrove destruction in Green Island?
Um, Mr. McKenzie, would you like to take this one? Uh, thank you, Juni. Well, I mean, I, I, the, the question says massive, wow, well, massive destruction of Mangu. Um, I don't know that we are aware of that. Just to say that the activities down there are permitted activities. They've been the subject of um, detailed assessment and environmental impact assessment was done. Um, various um, analyses were done and based on the deliberate, um, the information, the research, um, the authority made a decision with respect to this permit. So it's not a question of massive destruction as was indicated. Um, an era of mangrove was allowed to be removed. There were various measures put in place for um, compensation, um, relocation, etc. So it is not a mass destruction as the in, as would be. Some people want to imply. Um, so it's a managed situation. And in the final analysis, we feel that a balanced approach and a balanced decision was, was made with respect to this um, development. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. McKenzie. And this next question is for you as well. In the urban environment, what is being done to preserve, not replant, old trees that are being cut down daily and which are home to so much biodiversity? Right. So, again, we have a permit and licensing system that would account for the management and protection of vegetation, wildlife, flora and fauna. The question of trees in urban areas, and I know of a few instances where we have um, diseased and old trees that sometimes sometimes present a uh, risk to life and property, and where they can be uh, trimmed and so on because of their status in terms of age and disease and disease status and so on. Um, it might be appropriate for them to be trimmed or or removed. There are a number of cases in that respect, but I am not aware that there's been a wholesale um, removal of trees. Um, I suppose we'll have to speak to this as the specific case so that I can probably appropriately answer. But in general, I think when we have those big trees, and I remember a long time ago, there was this big tree up in Ligony, where that was that one was removed because of the purpose of whining that um, road that goes to Ligony. But in instances that I can speak to, it's as I said, those cases where we have those type, types of trees. Thank you very much. Right, thanks, Mr. McKenzie. All right, so we have a series of questions that were directed at Camilo. So I'm just going to read them one after the other, if that's OK. All right, so the first one is, and I think that's, this was in relation to the work that you have done in Freeport. I hope the Mobay bypass is not going through this area. 
The second one is what has been the impact, if any, of sea level rise on mangroves? And then the last one, what about the planned new grill and the huge destruction in Green Island for a major hotel? How will this affect your project? Okay, thank you. Well, I think the minister just Green Island. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought I had unmuted. Oops. Hi. <laughs> All right. So the minister spoke on the Green Island Hotel, and I do not have any mangrove restoration projects in Green Island, so I cannot comment on that. Thank you very much, Emma, for your commendations. Sea level rise on mangroves is actually positive, believe it or not. Sea level rise allows mangroves to go into more areas. However, if the area is already developed, and for the most part they are, then the mangroves have nowhere to go. Um, and studies have shown that climate change is actually being friendly to mangroves because mangroves are actually advancing to the poles. Um, in fact, there was a there was a market down in Florida where they had the, the northernmost mangroves and now they have expanded about 10 miles um, because of climate change. So um, sea level rise and climate change is good to mangroves if they are allowed to expand, which for the most part, they, they are not. The site that I have in Montego Bay, um, based on what I saw in the EIA, no, the Mobe bypass will not be going through that site. And even if it was, I believe there was a notation by NEPA that the Mobe bypass would not be allowed to affect that restoration site. So no, it would not be affecting that restoration site specifically. Thank you. Thanks, Camilla. And just reminding everybody, you can raise your hand and I'll acknowledge you and you can um, give us your questions verbally. So we are going on to know some questions that are for Loreen. And the first one is from Emma. Can you give examples of in invasive species in the Negril protected area? Okay, so based on information from our partners in the area, specifically the Negril Area Environmental Protection Trust, um, two species may be invasive in the area, which would be um, the wild ginger and Ipomia. But um, confirmed um, by the ecosystem restoration assessment that is to be done, which should also propose other invasive species that are to be controlled if they are found. So we just have speculations now on the ground that wild ginger and ipomia may be invasive um, or they may be in expressing invasive properties, which may be due to that they have more space now to grow and flourish because conditions have changed. Um, but it will be confirmed and more will be proposed when we have the ecosystem restoration consultancy executed and completed. Thanks, Lorene. And the next question for you is from Claire Nelson. She says, this is exciting. Tomorrow we are doing a program with, I'm not sure if this should be NEPT uh, or it is in fact NEAT and scouts in the grill to engage you. How are you doing participatory monitoring? Sorry again. Um, so on the component four of the project, that's where we have the public awareness and stakeholder engagement activities being undertaken. NEPT is actually doing an activity with the farmers um, where they're engaging the farmers in to teach them proper land husbandry techniques. We will also be signing a partnership agreement with the Rural Agricultural Development Authority to also um, conduct some farmers so those will also have assessments. Under our public awareness activity, which is why our watersheds, our wall campaign, why our watersheds, um, there is also, we, we are also in schools doing, conducting public awareness, co conducting stakeholder engagement, public awareness activities, and also doing lesson plans to schools. We have already engaged five schools in the area, two high schools and three primary level schools. Um, so all of those campaigns will have an assessment 
version to it to determine how we have impacted the, the community and how we can change going forward. I should also make mention that we have also conducted a KPB survey and knowledge, attitudes, practice and behavior survey. The project is required to do two. Um, we've completed the first one. So the first one has is currently informing our stakeholder engagement activities where it was found that the stakeholders and the residents, the younger generation are not as aware as we thought of the environmental, of the environmentally friendly activities that should be conducted. While those in the 40 year old and over bracket, um, they are more aware, but we have a lot of work to be done with the younger, with the younger generation. Um, so that's how we have been doing our stakeholder engagement based on um, assessments have been conducted. Um, so that's already in our, our stakeholder assessments going forward. <clears throat> thanks, Lorene. And I just want to say thanks to P.S. Hales for joining us today. He has to leave us at this point in time. So thanks again, P.S. Hales, for participating. Our, our next question is also for Loreen and it's also from Claire Nelson. And um, we also want to know how we can do a better job with social communications. Is there funding for us to do some small community projects on this? And she has a comment, this is really great information, but we need to democratize some of the key information down to a level of nine-year-olds who speak Jamaica, not science sign teas. So she wants to know if there's any funding for them to do small community projects. Communications bias. Um, it would be better to contact me so we can look at the project document and see if there's any leeway for us to um, form a partnership with you to conduct some of our engagement activities. Once it's within the Negril EPA, um, so you can contact me at the information. Just call NEPA and 876. 754-7540 and they'll transfer the call to my desk. So that's the easiest way. If I give you my email address, you're gonna miss an E and I'm not gonna get it. <laughs> so it's either to just call the office. All right, thanks, Lorene. All right, so we have a question for Marcia from Emma. How successful is coral relocation? How can you move them from one place to another? and what level of survival? Um, yes, that this, this speaks to the idea of what is success. Success um, with respect to coral relocation, the corals would have been totally destroyed if they weren't relocated. So there is a level of success. Um, what you find is not there's not 100% survival, because it depends on a number of things. You have moved, you have to dig the, the corals, they're rocks or their bases on a rock. You have to dig them out, you have to move them, you have to reattach them. Sometimes where you reattach them, the water current or other things are not favorable for them, or they are just so um, sort of traumatized that they don't recover. So there's never 100% survival but it is better than having them thoroughly obliterated by the process um, of digging the channels, the widening the ship channels for, for ships and cruise ships. It's also, nice. very, it's also a very expensive um, procedure, but it's usually written in as a mitigation measure for the whatever project um, that is being conducted, yes. All right, thank you. And now we're going to Denise. What species of turtles are doing well in your Portland area, in, East, in your protected area in East Portland? And this is also from Emily. All right. So we have primarily seen hawksbill turtles to be the ones that are nesting on our beaches, but we are also observing like adolescent green turtles residing here. Those are the only two that have really been noticed in any numbers. There have been talks about the occasional, and I mean very rarely, um, leatherback in the offshore areas, but primarily it's gonna be hawksbill and then small quantities of greens. Thanks, Denise. And we have another question for you from 
Ashley Codner, have you observed a reduction in sea turtle nesting beaches over the years? And a follow-up question for Nepal, what procedures are in place to preserve nesting beaches? So with regards to reduction in nesting beaches, the area has not been studied extensively. As I mentioned, our program is only about three years old. There was a previous program um, with PEPO, but it did not have extensive documentation. I do know anecdotally that there is at least one historically very active nesting beach, which is no longer active. So I know of that one, it, it's, we'll get maybe six nests on that beach right now because it is, it's been completely washed away, eroded of sand. So it's not really suitable as a nesting environment anymore. Um, so that, that's the best answer I can give to that question. All right, thank you. Um, Mr. McKenzie, do you want to take the follow-up question? What procedures are in place to preserve nesting beaches? Okay, all right, so we're going to move on to the next question. What, if anything, can citizens do to participate in the restoration of the coral reefs or to stop the destruction? So this is for Marcia from Shelley and Weeks. What, if anything, can citizens do to participate in the restoration of the coral reefs or to stop the destruction? Um, first of all, I think everything that um, goes towards protection of the environment, um, you know, reduce, reuse, recycle and all of that, um, reduce plastics, reduce pollution and um, support, you know, the, the work of the protected areas, especially the marine protected areas and so on. Um, those things that the individuals can do is very you as an individual cannot actually go and restore a coral or coral reefs because that would be very difficult and it's highly technical. But you can um, sort of spread the world that word about the, the state of the, the environment in general and how this environment impacts coral reefs and support your, or lobby your policymakers to make their appropriate changes and support the appropriate action and enforce the appropriate regulations so that the environment on a whole can be in a good condition because really it's not just like separate environments, the entire environment that is under threat from all angles, you know, the mangroves, the seagrass, the corals and so on. And so we really need to have a sort of concerted effort from, from citizens to do the thing that's right for the environment. All right, thanks again, Marcia. All right, Claire, I see you have some additional comments in the chat, but I think that um, you can use your conversation with Ms. Jones as a starting point to see how well you can engage NEPA with these ideas that you have and these things that you would like to see, to see how, if, how the agency can assist if they can or they could possibly point you in other directions to receive support. I am not seeing any more hands raised or any more questions or comments in the chat. Thanks for the comments, the information that was posted by Emma and Emma, no, you did not ask too many questions, you like questions. So if there are no other questions or comments, we can wrap up our webinar for today. So I just want to thank our presenters for their very informative presentations and there were many commendations in the chat for our presenters and the quality of the information that they have shared with us today. We want to also thank Minister Charles for joining us, Case Hales, and we want to thank our support team, our admin branch, PR, ICT, and especially to you who have joined us for our webinar. We we just have been talking among ourselves if you did not take the time to be with us today. And I just want to close by encouraging all of us to be part of Generation Restoration.
have a good rest of the Oh, sorry about that. Uh, there is another question and it's from Shelly and Weeks. I'm not sure if anybody here on the chat can answer, but I'll pose it and we'll see. What's the status of the parrotfish? Are they still endangered? Denise can answer that. <laughs> okay, Denise, go ahead. <laughs> uh, uh, parrot fish, as far as I know, they are not listed as endangered. They are not listed as endangered. Um, as scientists, as marine scientists, we're very concerned about them. Um, but the fact of the matter is, even though we're still catching a whole lot of juvenile parrot fishes, they are still one of the most abundant, abundant fishes in, in the reef context. Um, some species may have gone endangered or extinct, but I believe parrot fishes need a lot more study. And um, so we do lack some information on parrot fishes. We do know their important ecological roles. I would still encourage persons to stay away from the parrot fish where possible. But um, on the Jamaican laws and regulations, they are not endangered species. All right, thanks, Camilo. So we're going to wrap up again. So thanks again, everybody, and have a great rest of the afternoon. Thanks again for joining. Bye, everybody.